Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. Now this is the two hour chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now you can see we've got another pennant forming here. As I pointed out before, one of the most bullish formations you can have. This one doesn't have a lot of time to it, but I've drawn in a trend channel here just to show you where this price is going to reach the trend line and it's not really too far off you can see that the date there is the 16th so 16th to 17th looks like we meet back up with this trend line barring of course some catastrophic sell-off which always could happen but barring that at the rate we're going we'll roughly meet this trend line again on the 16th or so. Now I wanted to point out here in this trend channel I always like to draw trend channels because you can see that it's fairly staying within this channel except for this violation here which was a huge updraft but other than that section you can see it's come back into the trend channel that it had already established and let's just say that this trend channel holds so what I've done here is drawn a price of where it was on the 31st and then took it about a month later. Now these are very rough, so uh, it's just an, a guesstimate basically. But if we go a month out from there with this rising trend channel, and it was about in the middle of the trend channel. It takes us from about 1870 to as high as 2130, but really probably more in the middle of the trend channel. So we'll just say 1870 to 2070, just to be on the safe side. So that basically gives us a $2 a month rise in the trend channel. And if that holds, of course, then you can see after 10 months that would be $20 increase in the price of silver that would give us $41 silver 10 months from now 12 months from now it would give us uh, $24 on the price at about $45 we'd be a year from now about ready to test that $50 price now as I said in the last video that can always change because the trend channel can actually accelerate upward that's something like we saw back in the rise where we had a uh, increase in the rate of the trend back here in about October of 2011 so you can see that for a decent amount of time the trend was pretty steady there and it was even actually a fairly uh, consistent trend channel. I'm not drawing it correctly, but you can see it was a fairly consistent trend until about this point here. And then you can see that it took off into a new trend that was verging on parabolic. But then again, it could have gone much higher if the powers that be had not interfered in the market, we'll say. So that's what I'm expecting in the future. That very well could happen, a change in the trend direction to a sharper upside and that could get us to that $50 price a lot faster than a year out. But then again, with the current trend channel that I drew, it gets us to that $50 price in a little over a year from now. Now I wanted to take you over to some articles. Before I do that, I wanna show you the debt limit and I like to visit this. Now this is debt to the penny and as I pointed out before, what I always do is I take today's date and I take a year earlier and you can see here 7 12 2013 and you can see where we're standing at 16.738 trillion uh, now we're currently the latest figure we have is 17.591 so 17.6 so that's eight to nine hundred billion dollars now you can see that it sat here at this price what what was happening with the debt ceiling is they were using all kinds of shenanigans to get around it so we had that debt ceiling and, th and that's what we're going to look at but you can see without a debt ceiling that we're kind of 
just drifting higher. We actually hit that 17.5 figure all the way back in March. And we've been drifting around that. But if you look what happened after they finally released the debt ceiling, it came up to a price. Actually, I'm sorry, that's last fall. It it came it was stuck at sixteen seven thirty eight and then it went to sixteen seven forty seven and you can see that when they finally let it go it jumped about three hundred billion dollars then continued to rise so that one month later we went from sixteen point seven five trillion and a month later we were at seventeen point two trillion. So it quickly added a half a billion dollars in one month. Now that very well could happen this time, and that would mean that we would quickly go above $18 billion in the national debt. So you can see that there isn't any progress at all in the national debt, and where we're at right now is the debt ceiling is actually suspended until March 15th, of next year and the question one might ask is what do they know and why did they suspend it until then but I wanted to look at some articles here about government waste and as you can see we're not having these debates anymore but I said I've said many times in the past that they fully intend to run this thing off the tracks they have no intent whatsoever to pay back the debt and they really have no intent whatsoever of cutting government we can see also by the demonization of the tea party the tea party is portrayed as racists they're portrayed as terrorists they're portrayed as all kinds of things and it's really silly when you think about it because the message is pretty simple it is we need to reduce the size of government but of course that is a big threat to people who make their living feeding at the public trough so let's take a look at some of the things that are going on now and I can tell you it's not getting any better this is from Dan Mitchell great moments in government waste and inefficiency He says, but every so often, notwithstanding everything I just wrote, I can't resist pointing out really absurd examples of wasteful spending. And today, we have two jaw-dropping examples. We know that government bureaucracies like palatial buildings and that cost overruns are the rule rather than the exception. Well, one of the new bureaucracies created by the Dodd-Frank bailout bill is setting records for extravagance with its new headquarters the newly created Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is renovating the Washington DC headquarters. It rents at a cost per square foot that is more expensive than Trump World Tower in New York City. The CFPB project is estimated to cost taxpayers more than $215 million. Cost projections have increased $65 million in six months and $120 million since last year's estimate. Some of the building's extravagant features include a four-story glass staircase, two-story waterfall, and a sunken garden. Does that look like the behavior of people who are worried about our national debt? But what's really amazing is that all this money is being spent on a rented building and that the cost of renovating it is far greater than it than what was spent on building. Yes, building, not just renovating some of the world's most famous landmark structures. Now for our second example, we've heard all about how big chunks of education spending gets wasted on bureaucracy and doesn't get used for classroom instruction. And we read about how welfare bureaucrats consume a lot of money that supposedly is targeted to help poor people. This principle also applies to other forms of government spending. CNN reports that federal government program for emergency food aid around the world is such a cluster you know what that barely a bit more than one third of the money is actually spent on food for crisis stricken regions. International typhoons, hurricanes, and earthquakes 
leave behind devastating scenes of poverty and need. If you had a 1.5, if you had about 1.5 billion dollars every year to send food to such desperate areas, how would you do it? The way the U.S. provides international food aid is an antiquated and bureaucratic tangle. Food largely has to be purchased here in the U.S. and then shipped on boats by U.S. cargo carriers to trouble spots. The Government Accountability Office says that 65% of the money for this aid program is spent on shipping and business costs, not on food. It's a system that has helped shipping companies and unions win billions in government contracts. Companies like Maersk, there's also a Transport Workers Union. Two leading maritime unions gave more than three quarters of a million dollars to members of the current House of Representatives in the 2012 election cycle, according to the Center for Public Integrity. What an example of insider corruption. So let's look at another. Now, he briefly mentioned there the embassies and what's going on with them. So I want to read you a story about their new embassies here. The State Department's wasteful, dangerous plan for more beautiful, more energy-efficient embassies. And this is June 4th of this year. A new State Department initiative to build unique, energy-efficient embassies across the globe is drawing criticism for both its excessive cost and the security concerns posed by the time it's taking to build new embassies. As part of the initiative called Design Excellence, a new U.S. embassy in London is scheduled to open in 2017, six months into construction, according to a new report from CBS News. The $1 billion project is already $100 million over budget. Meanwhile, in Papua, Papua New Guinea, the State Department completely discarded a proposed embassy design and had to entirely restart the project, which will now cost $211 million instead of the $50 million. Can you imagine that? The cost of the embassy in New Guinea, $200 plus million. What is the G GDP, GNP of New Guinea? How many poor people are there there? They're spending unbelievable amounts of money for an embassy in this poor country. So there's another example. Unbelievable waste that our government just throws away money. And here's the last one I'll read to you. This is from Citizens Against Government Waste. And this is called The Cost of Free by Sean Kennedy. Clay County, Missouri Police Captain Matt Hunter described his department's new acquisition, a 54,000-pound, 10-foot-tall vehicle known as a mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicle, or an MRAP, as a $750,000 machine that we got for absolutely nothing. Taxpayers didn't have to pay anything for it, he said. Such is the attitude for many members of local law enforcement who have eagerly chased handouts from the Pentagon, Pentagon's 1033 Excess Property Program. Since the early 1990s, the 1033 program, which has experienced a rapid expansion following a conclusion of the Iraq War and the drawdown of U.S. forces in Afghanistan, has distributed excess military equipment to local police. The program has offloaded equipment worth more than $4.3 billion, including $450 million in 2013. Beyond the semantical argument over Captain Hunter's comments, Clay County taxpayers most certainly paid for the MRAP with federal tax contributions, if not with local taxes. The, the bestowment of the MRAPs to local law enforcement has raised questions over the best use of extra military equipment. Several instances in recent years of local police acquiring military-grade hardware have made national headlines. A July 31, 2013 Associated Press article found that a disproportionate share of the 1,033 equipment found its way to police departments and sheriff's offices in rural areas that suffer little crime. For example, in Morvan, Georgia, 
the population of 532, local police acquired a shipment of bayonets. While admitting the blades never made it out of storage, police, police chief Linwood Yates stated, that was one of those things in the old days you got because you thought it was cool. Then after you get it, you're like, what the heck am I going to do with this? In Richland County, South Carolina, the sheriff managed to get his hands on an armored personnel carrier equipped with a machine gun that he dubbed the Peacemaker. The MRAP was originally procured because of an urgent need to provide troops in Afghanistan and Iraq with better protection against roadside bombs. The Department of Defense initially spent approximately $44 billion to procure around 28,000 MRAPs. These vehicles incorporate V-shaped hulls to deflect blasts and heavy armor, while the DOD contracted for several different models with a variety of price tags. A conservative estimate places the cost of each MRAP at about $500,000. Well, you know that somebody made a lot of money on that. Of course, now they've got their commission and uh, everybody's been paid and the equipment is paid for, so we couldn't sell it off to anyone, of course, try to recoup some of our money or we couldn't keep it ready for the next war so we don't have to spend another $44 billion. No, we're going to go ahead and give it away to local law enforcement. So that's the insanity of our leaders. These people are crazy. And of course, like I said, they have no intention of paying off the debt. Now here's the statement about the debt limit. We know that the debt limit has been suspended until March 15th of next year. But here's the Treasury's take on it, debt limit. The debt limit is the total amount of money that the United States government is authorized to borrow to meet its existing obligations, including Social Security and Medicare benefits, military salaries, interest on the national debt, tax refunds, and other payments. The debt limit does not authorize new spending commitments. It simply allows the government to finance existing legal obligations that Congresses and Presidents of both parties have made in the past. Failing to increase the debt limit would have catastrophic economic consequences. Hmm. So, failing to raise the debt limit has catastrophic economic consequences, but spending a trillion dollars more a year than you take in, in taxes, that's not what causes catastrophic economic consequences. It would cause the government to default on its legal obligations, an unprecedented event in American history. That would precipitate another financial crisis and threaten the jobs and savings of everyday Americans, putting the United States right back in deep econ a deep economic hole just as the country is recovering from the recent recession. Yes, this is a government page. Uh, sound a little bit non-biased? No, it's not the financial crisis caused by us balancing the budget that threatens the jobs and savings of everyday Americans. It's the spendthrift Congress and the Senate and the President who are spending this country into oblivion. They're the ones who are threatening another crisis. And of course, we know this. We know that they plan to renege on this debt. I think it's probably coming pretty soon here. Congress has always acted when called upon to raise the debt limit. Since 1960, Congress has acted 78 separate times to permanently raise, temporarily extend, or revise the definition of the debt limit. 49 times under Republican presidents and 29 times under Democratic presidents. In the coming weeks, Congress must act to increase the debt limit. Congressional leaders in both parties have recognized that this is necessary. Recently, however, a number of myths about this issue have begun to surface. Seriously? This is the last statement that we have from the Treasury on the national debt? Talking about how they need to increase the debt limit? That's insane. That happened over a year ago when they extended it. And then in February of this year, they put it off indefinitely by extending it to just suspending it, basically. So here we see, this is what you have when you have a government that is out of control. You have so many people feeding at the public trough. It's now in everybody's interest 
to drive the debt up because they're the ones who are getting paid. It doesn't matter if they're military contractors. It doesn't matter if they're collecting welfare benefits. It doesn't matter if they're pork projects or embassies overseas. All of it is the same thing. It's everybody seeing how much money they can pilfer from the taxpayer before this entire thing collapses. And I guarantee you that this thing is going to collapse soon. I know I've been saying that for a long time and a lot of people have been saying that for a long time, but I don't see how it can go on forever. And it appears that the BRICS or someone else like them is going to put their foot down and say enough is enough. You can't continue to borrow money from us and force us to use your currency and spend a trillion dollars a year more than you take in on wasteful projects and things that you don't even need. And of course, when that happens, then all bets are off. We don't even know what's going to happen. It might just be everything shut down overnight. So that's why people stack physical silver, because we really don't know what's coming in the future. But we do know that whether or not it's inflation, hyperinflation, deflation, default, collapse, or currency crisis, we know that in any of those scenarios that the true value of silver is not going to be lost going through the crisis but coming out the other end people who have stacked physical silver they're going to be able to trade it for goods that really have value just as silver does and they'll probably do very well on the other side of it and we'll talk to you next time